Well, good morning, everybody, from the front row to the back row to those online or down at the lodge. For those in the concourse, I met uh, Carter out there in the, uh, uh, in the cafe. I said I would say hello to him. Hi, Carter. He's probably about eight years old. So it's good to see you all. As David said, it is so good to be together. It's so good to work together with the staff here, and we're just grateful you're here, especially if you're here for the first time. Uh, for the, if you're new with us, we, we love that and hope you have some time to get to know somebody around you or can engage uh, in some way in that. Uh, there is that wisdom wall in the back. When we were trying to find a cutoff, we thought 70 because David didn't want my wisdom out there. So, <laughs> I'm being struck. I, I, let, let's say a word of prayer. I need to settle my heart here. Let, let's say another word of prayer here. Okay, so Lord Jesus, you are in the room with us. You are with those in the concourse. You're with those in the cafe. You're with those online. Lord, sometimes I think it's just a matter of our belief. Do we believe that you're with us? So Lord, guide us, we pray. And we pray that you would allow us through the power of your spirit to know of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, have you ever done a stupid thing? Like, oh, can't believe I did that. A friend of mine backed up his truck too fast and forgot that there was a trailer attached to the truck. So it swung around and uh, put a huge gash in his back door and rear panel. He was in a hurry. Oh. Another friend of mine left his house in a hurry to lead a winter retreat with high school students and forgot his duffel bag. The whole weekend, the same stuff, underneath stuff and everything. <laughs> he had a red and white rugby shirt on. This is back in uh, the 80s when the red and white rugby shirts were pretty cool. And he looked like, also from the 80s, Where's Waldo the whole weekend. <laughs> Another friend of mine was trying to do too much at once when he had his first little baby boy. You know, when you just kind of rush around and you're trying to keep your life as normal as it was. So he made himself a delicious sandwich and uh, he decided he needed to walk upstairs to get something. So he was giving a break to his wife. So he had the baby in one hand, but a plate with his delicious sandwich and a Coke in the other hand and he lost his balance on the stairs. Uh, so he had to make a decision at that point. <laughs> the baby or the grilled cheese and the Coke. So uh, it was a mess, but he saved the baby. And recently, this friend of mine stood in a stream after the big rainstorm we had, and the water was rushing. He kind of pulled a hamstring a little bit, and he almost got swept away in the stream. It's a friend of mine, and I think I would avoid that friend <laughs> unless he's preaching to you this morning. <laughs> Pastor Ray Ortland said, Proverbs is good news for bad people. It's about grace for sinners. It's about hope for failures. It's about wisdom for idiots. It's wisdom for a friend of mine. Greek was not one of my favorite classes in seminary, but as I took it, I learned some words that really stuck with me. They, we get some of our words from the Greek, and one of the ones that I will never forget is hideos. I thought that was interesting. It meant something different than I thought. It's where we get our word idiot from, but actually, here's what it really means. It means somebody who goes their own way, individuality as opposed to one living for the common good. So I think we're overworked, we're overstressed, we're running too fast, we're running into walls. And as Forrest Gump once said, stupid is as stupid does. Do you know what ultimate wisdom is? Our passage, we'll talk about it this morning. Here's what it is. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. I was praying with David between services and I thought I would love to sit with each one one of you, have somebody with you to say, what are my blind spots? What are the things that I need to know? Or what are you coming in here with this morning? 
what will you be preoccupied so you don't hear from God's word and we believe it's God's word? Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So before we begin, I'm just going to give you a bit more context for Proverbs. Proverbs is written for everyone. If you've been following along, you'll see a lot of father-son kinds of things in there, like, oh, maybe it's just father-son kind of wisdom. But that's not what Proverbs 1.8 tells us. It says this, listen to my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. And throughout the book, we know that this wisdom is for everyone. It's for all of humankind. Humankind would be good to listen to Proverbs, whether they were in faith or not. There are some Proverbs in there that are beautiful and have great wisdom. It's written in poetic form. Why? To get our attention. Some of the language in there is very vivid. And you're like, whoa, hey, I can't believe he said that. It's written with vivid images to get our attention, but it's also written because it's poetry in parallelism. That means the first verse often is accompanied by the second verse, which complements that first verse. It sort of explains what the first verse was saying. So pay attention to that as we read, because we're going to read through all of chapter 4, okay? Okay. Now, Proverbs is also meant to read in, be read in community. So I love uh, the idea that the staff came up with. Really, was David's idea, but I didn't want to give him credit. But anyway, the 70-year-old seven, or older, let's get some ideas so that we can uh, glean off the wisdom from everybody. It's meant to be read in community. I mean, people in the first, second century, they didn't have this. And a lot of times we get quiet in a room and we just want to read by ourselves. But Proverbs is meant to be read in community, to glean wisdom for people with other experience or wisdom than ours. I'm grateful we're going through it together as a church. And if you want to find a daily guide to it, if you just want to start tomorrow, which would be the 15th, just start there and pull it up on our website. And there's some great accompaniment kind of devotion with it. And finally, Proverbs is biblical wisdom that is sometimes imitated. Like I said, some of the words in there, you're like, oh, you know, you may not even have faith, but it's great wisdom. But those things are not reinforced by our culture. Proverbs reminds us that we're valuable to God and reminds us that our best days (laughs) are when we're walking the path that God gave us. And you know that it begins, even if it's hard, it feels like his presence is there and it shines brighter, not darker. We even read a verse like that in Proverbs chapter 4. So let's get started. Proverbs chapter 4, I'm going to read it through to you. Um, You can follow it on the screen if you have your own Bible or on your phone. Um, But I was just thinking it might be, some of you might want to just close your eyes so it's like you're hearing these words. And they're to you. And they're to us. So here we go. Listen, my sons and daughters, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me and he said to me, take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction and do do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and go your own way. For those evil ones, they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. Don't you be one of them. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of righteous, though, is like the morning sun shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. 
My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ears to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The most precious thing about you is your heart. It's not about your stature. It's not about your physical appearance. It's not about your accomplishments. It's not about a favorite place of yours or a place of rest. The most precious thing about you is your heart. So you want to know what wisdom for life is? Guard it. Guard your heart. Here's what we know. You cannot go through this life without your heart being wounded. Without a hurtful word being said to you. Without a broken body through your own illness or without a broken dream. You can't go through this life without hearing bad news. These things affect our heart. Our family recently received word that the coastal place in Maine that we love was just devastated by the recent Northeaster. So my heart was understandably sad to the point of preoccupation, to the point of watching newsreels, to the point of trying to figure out more of what was going on. So it stopped me in my track. I wondered if we could go there this summer and it preoccupied my thoughts. Now, I was understandably sad. I understand that. You can't go through this life without your heart being wounded. But there is healing. There is something beyond that. There will be scars in this life, but there's also hope if we set our hearts on the right things. So, we can probably stop the sermon here. As David said a couple weeks ago, it's almost like it's poetry. It's, it's, it's lessons for us. It's not like we've got to like unpack it a whole lot. It's pretty obvious. Above all else... Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The heart is a central control of your life. It what controls you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It's central to everything. But what we let into our heart and the path we choose to take can influence everything that we do. If we gaze long enough into the mirror... (laughs) or try to define our own self-worth or identity outside of who God calls us to be, if we compare ourselves long enough to someone else or simply go with the flow of what feels good, because I need it, it will capture your heart. It's not innocent. It'll capture it. Ray Orland puts it this way. Life does not flow from the outside in. It flows from the inside out. So we put it in us, and then it's going to flow right back out. We need our hearts continuously filled with the ever-fresh life of Jesus Christ. So, above all else, guard your heart, for it determines the course of your life. You may not even be in a place of great faith this morning. Guard your heart. It's good advice. Because out of it, it's going to determine the course of your life. Thomas Chalmers was a minister who lived in Scotland 200 years ago, and he said this, even when we see the stupidity of our sins and how empty they are and how they only make us sad, that realization still does not change us. We start changing only when we see Christ, when we see that Christ will make us alive in ways our most darling sins cannot. Sometimes I think we can learn more from the old dead guys than the new, young, enlightened guys who put individual happiness above all things. Another old dead guy said this, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That was Augustine who died in the fourth century. They're both telling us the same thing as we hear this morning. Above all else, guard your heart. For out of it is a wellspring of life. 
Jesus says, come to me, all you who are thirsty, and I will give you something to drink. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me, and rivers of living water will flow out of you. Above all else, your heart is valued. It's the most important part of you. It's what's most valuable. It's what God gave you, and it's how God created you to be connected to the divine. This is the heart that God gave you. So it's interesting that Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Most commentators would say in the context, it means he's standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking. He said, Behold, I stand there and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. Jesus also said, life doesn't consist in the abundance of your possessions. Don't get your heart convoluted with all of that. But instead, life is found with Christ at the center, doing everything every day with you. So that means something very practical to me. Recently in my spiritual walk, when I pray, when I'm out to a meal, I often will just pray, knowing God's already there. I don't have to invoke his presence. Now, Lord, you're... you're over here but would you bless this food (laughs) I just pray sometimes with my eyes open Lord I thank you for my brother here I thank you for the food that we're about to eat we are in this together Christ at the center of your heart when we are in Christ when Christ is at the center of your heart you're united with him he's not out here he's in there that's even when it's difficult That's even when you walk into a place of darkness. That's why the Bible says don't unite yourself with that because you're uniting Christ with it. But he doesn't leave you. He's merciful every morning. As David Dwight once said, I'm not going into surgery. We're going into surgery. I'm not going into this hard conversation alone. We're going into this hard conversation alone. Jesus is not outside of us waiting for you to say, come on in again. He's with us in everything. And there is power in that if you believe that. To follow Christ at the center of your heart, you don't need to measure up to the best Christians you know. You just walk the path that God has laid out for you, not someone else's path. And when you're united with Christ, he is greater than any mistake that you might make. Remember, we talked about that. Don't bring him into the darkness. But he's greater than that if you do make that mistake, if you do go down the dark path. 1 John 3.20 gives us reassurance of this. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. He made them. And he knows everything. So when John says that God is greater than our hearts, he's telling us that God is greater than our desires, our emotions, our will. Our shame may be strong, but he's stronger still. Our sin may be great, but he is greater still. When he's at the center of our hearts, when Christ is at the center, he'll put us on the right path again. And here's what we know. Here's the reality when we leave. Transformation is not easy. I struggle all the time thinking, why am I not the person I need to be yet? I was reading this past week that the uh, person who wrote and penned Amazing Grace, He was a slave trader, and there was a a, a huge storm on the sea, and Lord, if you save my life, I'll give my life to you, and he gave his life to the Lord, and he remained in slave trading for 40 years until he decided, I got to get out of this. Transformation is hard. It's not overnight. Sometimes it takes a lifetime. Paul Tripp says to be human is to need help. That's kind of refreshing to me. I need help. Some of us would not have chosen some of the heartache that has come into our lives. We just wouldn't. But here's what I know. The old guys have said it, and I can say it to you this morning. Jesus will never leave you. He's never failed us, and he's not going to fail us now proven over the centuries he that began a good work in you will see it to completion until the day of christ you know who wrote that the apostle paul and you know where he wrote it from from the beach hanging out 
Getting a suntan. He that began a good work in you will see a completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He wrote it from prison. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So, I'm going to close with three reasons to guard your heart. And when the pastor says close, prepare for another 30 minutes. (laughs) Here's three reasons to guard your heart. Guard your heart because your heart is valuable to God. Okay? It's the most precious thing about you. You might put a lid on your trash can, but you don't guard your trash. (laughs) Your heart is the most precious thing about you. Guard your heart. Guard your heart because it's the source of all your words and actions. If you feel like it's just not been very good lately... I've been saying things I shouldn't say. What else is going on in your heart? I was taking the recycling trash out of the house at the height of the storm last week. Right now, my uh, adult son and his wife live with us with a dog, and he lives there too, and so there's like four of us. So I took the recycle and the trash out, and the rain had just started on Tuesday. I mean, and then it... I mean, it came in like a sheet, and I'm like, oh, no, bad timing. I came in soaking wet. So I made some sarcastic remark about getting washed away in the storm. Here lies Pete. He was the only one around here that took out the trash. (laughs) I mean, I really said that. And then my wife handed me another bag. You forgot this one. Sometimes my sarcasm reveals my selfish heart. (laughs) Folks, life doesn't flow from the outside in. What are we putting in our hearts? It's going to flow from the inside out. And then guard your heart because it's always under attack. You know, in the first service, uh, that made me emotional too. And I'm thinking, why, even now as I say it? Because it's so true. We all know it. Our heart is always under attack. The enemy fights against us on the battleground of the heart. Let me count the practical ways he does that. Maybe you resent the way you're treated at home or at work. So maybe you lash out or let sarcasm rule the day. You just lost ground on the battlefield of the heart. Maybe you're spending money again on something you want but don't really need and it puts you in more debt. You've let your guard down and just lost ground on the battlefield of your heart. Maybe you harbor a pattern of internet sexual sin. You've let your guard down and lost ground on the battlefield of the heart. Maybe someone else's impressions of you is more important than God's impression of you. You let your guard down and lost ground on the battlefield of the heart. Now, I'm not doing this because I know how hard it is. And sometimes we are in such a pattern that the wiring of our brain changes and we need help. But it's just a realization this morning that your heart's always under attack. Maybe you don't believe in miracles anymore. I used to pray when I was a younger believer all the time for healing for people. Now I don't do it as much. I'm like, hmm. Maybe you become complacent when it comes to your faith. Jesus says to pray for healing for your brothers and sisters. What he wills will be what he wills. It's not up to us. Keep praying. Don't let your guard down and lose ground on the battlefield of the heart. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do will flow from it. 
There is hope. There is always hope because there's Christ. He's not finished with us yet. Jesus is too wise to make a mistake with us. He is too kind to injure us. He has mercy for you. He's too tender to crush us. Wisdom reminds us of who we are. Wisdom in knowing how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ for you. You can stand upon that rock. Wisdom reminds us that real life is found with Christ at the center. And if you feel he's been away from you or you don't have that relationship, I invite you to enter into that relationship with Jesus Christ. That he would be at the center of your heart. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That means if worry or anxiety is in your heart, you're going to have a lack of light. Don't let anxiety rule. Jesus said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. It's a startling verse when you read it. A cold heart, a calloused heart is a lack of heat in your heart. Don't let wickedness in. Don't let callousness rule the day. Above all else, guard your heart. All of us have been hurt or injured in life, and it's easy to look for a temporary fix of the heart. But God did not make us for a temporary fix, but to connect to the divine. So last week I was hosting in a lodge. Some of you may be watching down there this morning. And in the second service, I often will come to the back and watch from back there. And I was sitting back there, and there was a family, a mom and a dad, with two little girls. They were four-year-old twins. And I came back there, sat down, kind of looked at them, you know, kind of distracting them. That's what I do. <laughs> and the one little four-year-old girl from her daddy's lap went like this. I'm like, what am I, stranger danger here? <laughs> but I was smiling about that. Later this week, I thought, you know, because I'm, I'm a very visible person. I mean, I like to see things. I like to experience things. Sometimes it helps me. So I thought, what if we try something like this week, like that this week to guard our heart? Let's physically guard our hearts. Let's physically put our mind, body, and words into guarding the heart. Here are the three things I would suggest. First, identify the enemy. (laughs) But in all seriousness, the first battle of the heart is to expose the enemy of the heart. I know I'm going down this path, but the Bible also says no temptation has seized you except what is common to everybody. And God is just. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So look for the way out. I see you. And then physically, (laughs) I was telling David between services, I went to a stoplight after a wedding last night, and my mind was getting preoccupied, and I know I had to preach this morning. You know what I did? I went, I was at a stoplight, don't worry. Physically, guard your heart. Put your hands over your chest and guard your heart. And then, open your hands to God. One of the best ways to guard your heart, Tim Keller says, is worship. I see you. What are you worried about this morning? Redirect your worry. Refocus your heart. It's time to get out of the creeks that we're wading around in and into the wellspring of great life. Above all else, guard your heart, for it will determine the course of your life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, even in the silence, the the enemy seeks to distract us. 
We try to put those things out of our heart that worry us or make us anxious. The diagnosis we've received with a friend that's not well. And Lord, you've given us compassionate hearts. You've given us hearts to care. But we pray, Father, that we would open our hands to greater trust. That even if it's the thing that we would not choose, that we would believe that you were sovereign. That you're greater than our worry. And that eternity is our home. So help us to walk through this path of life with greater wisdom. We need help, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen.